everyone, this is Richard Solomon and Antonio Sayat. This is a co-production of Taking Care of Business, tcbradio.com, and Rocket Green Radio. Our special guest this week is Alex Beard. Alex, welcome to the show, and thanks for being with us. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure. So tell everybody, what do you do as far as an environmental cause, and where did that, that passion, because you do some really unique and interesting stuff. Yeah, so... So let me start by telling you that I'm a painter, primarily, first and foremost. I, I make oil paintings on canvas and ink drawings on paper, and I write books, and I, I try to tell stories through the art that I make. Now then, I have to ask myself, as an artist, what is my job? Am I a decorator? Am I a dilettante? Or do I have greater purpose? And if you're not in competition with your peers, but rather part of a part of a longer path towards a pursuit into truth and beauty, as in the artist's responsibility is to perceive truth and beauty, even when ugly, and then put that in a fashion which is universal enough so that the viewer can perceive themselves in relationship to their surroundings and greater understand the truth and beauty implicit in the art, right? So, what does that have to do with the environment? I, for 30 years, have more probably now, uh, have been stopping around the world in places where there's usually more animals than people, looking right. for the intrinsic way in nature that things move so that I can put that into my art. Uh, and what I mean by that is, for example, why is the spiral in the seashell the same shape as the arms of our entire galaxy? And where can you find that same nautilus in the way that things move in the observable universe around you? And then what does that teach you about interconnectedness, for example? Right? So during the course of those travels, many of them in Africa, but not exclusively, I went to India for seven months to try to find a tiger in the wild, and I did a bunch of diving in the Great Barrier Reef where the rainforest meets the reef north of Cairns and Queensland, and then, of course, many trips to Africa over the years. And through the course of those times, I've been a firsthand witness to the crashing of the environment. Right? I mean, I'd go to places where when I was a teenager, it was vibrant and full of life, and now it's asphalt. There's a, wow. I learned to drive in East Africa with an old Land Rover on what was then a pair of parallel goat tracks, like 20 miles outside of Nairobi, and is now looks like Houston. Wow. Just down the road was a tree under which the charcoal salesman had been sitting for God only knows how long, selling their little bags of charcoal. And now it's a Kentucky Fried Chicken. Right? So there's been very palpable, obvious things in front of my nose that says that the thing that I love is in jeopardy. Now then, you know, we all know that there's a greater um, holistic scar, wound, uh, between our relationship as human beings and our environment. Um, right. so you, but that's so be a little it, esoteric unless you see it firsthand. Right. So in, in your experience in, in all these years of exploring and uh, painting and, and in Africa and India, have you seen changes uh, firsthand? I mean, uh, oh, not, yeah. just in the, not, just, not just in the wildlife, but in, in the climate itself. I mean, your personal experience. Well, you know, yes is the short answer to that, but... Um, I'm not a scientist, so my version of right. it is a little more per in terms of perception. But yeah, do I see right. drought cycles that extend in crazy amounts of time? Absolutely. Do I see places that were previously lush and full of life now bleached and, and barren? Absolutely. Right? It's not, uh, uh, it's, these things are, 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 are observable to the layman's eye. At this point, let, let me ask a question uh, because you mentioned the Great Barrier Reef, and I've read yeah. that the Great Barrier Reef is in tremendous 
decline. Yes. Talk about that if you don't mind. From your personal well, observations. How sad. I mean, how sad because diving at the Great Barrier Reef when I was in my early twenties in the nineteen nineties, in the early nineteen nineties, was like being in a different universe. It opened my eyes to a panoply of color and life that I neither expected nor um, nor could get rid of as, as, as a picture in my mind of what a vibrant environment should look like. All underwater, of course, too, right? So, so what it was was extraordinary. And what it's become, there are still pockets of it that are extraordinary and probably will be, and it may very well shift north as the temperatures in the sea changes. I mean, it may be that we're just changing one out for another, and you've got to go a little farther up into the ring of fire and places like that, but, but it doesn't take away from the fact that one of the great and most extraordinary things that's taken millions of years, if not more, to, to, to come to the point that I saw when I was 20 is now a, a shell of its former self in less than, you know, in less than a decade or in le less than a few decades. Well, I think, it, I think it was done. Lord Acton who said the power to destroy is infinitely greater than the power to create because, you know, if you look, think about it, it, it took, you know, how many years it took to build the World Trade Center and it took one day to take it down. Yeah. You know, well, and if you yeah. think. Uh, and, and so many other, and so many other parallels. It's like money, right? Yeah, very easy to yeah. spend, awful hard to make. Exactly, exactly. I, by the way, I'm a I'm a certified scuba diver. So as a fellow diver, I I really appreciate you know the the, the scuba experience because you're getting you know a, a much different view of the world because it's you know the, what you touch and the whole body temperature thing and the way water uh, reflects. You know, you really do. You're really in a different dimension altogether because you know between the bubbles. Well, for you, per for you as the person who's diving, it's also meditative because the only thing you hear is your breathing and yeah. your heartbeat and your own thoughts. Yep, yep. And so, as a result, it slows your pace, right? I mean, a, a, a fast breathing diver is an unsuccessful diver. And right? don't. So it's, you're talking about moderating your own system to get more in tune with the environment that you're in. And that's part of that experience, too. Because to me, the thing that's so, so interesting about a place like, the, like diving at the Great Barrier Reef when full of life is that you also get a great sense of the system, of the interconnectedness of all of it and the interreliance of all of it. And that then, in turn, if you're interested in painting like I am, that means you're interested in composition. And so that then means that you know that there's a certain there's a certain spider web, if you will, to the to keep the painting together, and that as the component parts of the composition are taken away, the end result falters. And that's true in nature too, right? I mean, you sure. you go into the system sure. and you start taking these integral parts of it out, and the whole thing ultimately ends up collapsing. So it's, it's like a tent. You know, you have a tent with a bunch of poles in it, and it's it's great with ten poles, and it's still standing with seven. Uh, and then it's kind of tottering at five, and you take out one more, and the whole thing comes down. And then you have to start from scratch again to put it back up. So how do you, as a diver, capture the essence of a three-dimensional world that's not like the three-dimensional world on land in something that's two-dimensional? Um, fluidity is the short answer. That's an interesting answer. Uh, I believe that. Very interesting. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> That's an fluidity interesting answer. The way that okay. you do it. Well, and it's because it has to do with the three dimensional. If you're talking about diving in this case, yeah. that three dimensional environment is a fluid one, not just literally, yeah. but also in the way that it feels. And so, if you're then in turn trying to make a painting which is evoking that, you want the eye to travel through the composition in the same way that the fish swims around the reef. Right? I mean, you ultimately don't want to have your eye fall off the bottom right-hand corner. You want it to be swimming around in and out, in and out, and up and down and back and forth. And I design my painting so that that's what your eye does. Lots of ways in, very few ways out. That, that's, that's, uh, you know, so. that, that's truly fascinating because as, as someone who uh, – I'm very passionate about the ocean, and I actually worked on the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act in Turks and Caicos. 
uh, way back yeah. as volunteer many years ago to protect their reefs down there. They had a, a, a conservation group called Pride, like Preservation of Reefs. I forgot what the whole acronym is now, but uh, yeah. But you know, the diving there was unbelievable back back in the day because Turks and Caicos mm-hmm. was sort of undiscovered at that time. And now, like many other places, you know, I share what you know. You talk about you know Jethro Tull's song. Looks like the farm is a freeway is kind of very apropos, you know. To, to, look, <laughs> yeah. where, where, when I grew yeah. up, when I grew up, uh, not that far from my house in Queens, was a tomato farm, wow. and yet when I was ten years, and it was a tomato farm with a horse. Okay, in Queens, not that yeah. not that long ago, and yet no, they, no, not that long they, ago. And they bulldozed it, made it into like a four family house or something like that, and yeah. or or four family houses. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, they just been doing a lot of that, you know. Yeah, you know, look in in, in in just the last few years, you know, Antonio and I are New Yorkers, and if you look at places like Western Queens, which is Long Island City, it, it's beginning to look like the Manhattan skyline. Yeah, and and oh, yeah. The, and the density and the density and the building and the building, and of course, they're not necessarily using you know sustainable materials, and of course. Uh, our highways and water and sewer are not getting bigger, and yet there's more and more demand on all of the infrastructure that's crumbling and old. Well, we have a we have a fundamental choice to make as human beings, and I'm not sure, frankly, what the what the answer to the choice is. But we currently live in a state where where there is huge overpopulation, huge overconsumption a vast raping of natural resources in order to feed that. And, yeah. um, right. And, 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 and no prospect to figure out what to ultimately do about the unrest globally that that kind of pressure puts on us collectively. All right. So that's, that, that could be viewed as a political question, but I think it's actually more of a spiritual one, and I don't mean it in terms of God and Buddha and the prophet, etc. I mean it in terms of who are we as human beings and how do we relate to each other and our surroundings? And what the- is the actual balance that we need in order for us not to behave as if there's too many rabbits in the warren? Because if there are too many rabbits in the warren, they eat each other and stop reproducing. Well, you know, uh, so, so nature teaches us lessons, and we should be we, we we are fools not to not to heed the lessons of our environment. When I grew up, there were rabbits all over the place. Now you don't see them at all. No, seriously. <laughs> you know, that, that's, it's funny that you say that because it's absolutely true. I was in New Jersey, and I I I, I kid you not, uh, I grew up in New Jersey, and I used to see rabbits all the time. And, you know, I, I recently went, and I don't see any. Or I, or I see squirrels, but I, I never... Yeah, I mean, uh, where the I, I went, I was in China a couple of years ago doing a show in Hong Kong, and afterwards I wanted to go to the Great Wall of China. So my wife and I went about three hours north of Beijing up into the Yan Mountains, which is uh, sort of craggly. If you imagine what the, what the Great Wall of China looks like when you see the pictures of it on the mountaintops, where it's crumbling and hasn't nobody's been walking on it for 500 years. That's where uh, we went, right? Uh, so it's in the middle of the middle of absolutely nowhere. And I, I don't know how many people go up there a year, but not many. It's arduous. You get up at four o'clock in the morning. You stay in a little peasant village. You get up at four o'clock in the morning, and you start hiking to get up to the, the, the you know thousands of feet up to get up onto the highway of the Great Wall, and then you can walk the the mountaintops, right? So. The idea is that that would be pretty extraordinary, and that, and it was. But in the process of the days of walking that we did in this forest, in which there's not a lot of industrialization, etc., there wasn't a single animal, not a bird, not a squirrel, not a nothing. Empty, empty, empty. And when you go walking in, in Africa, which I do basically every year, I go out on foot to track elephants, and, you know, on camel safari, and I mm. sleep under trees, and I go because I want to listen to the birds dawn, and I want to, you know, go and be in tune with nature. And if you go into the forest, and the elephants aren't in there because they've been driven out by poachers or 
gunshots in the hills or pressure being put on by people driving their livestock through or whatever, the forest feels different. It doesn't have the life that the vibrant, that vibrant environments do. And when you are in them, if you know the difference, it's something which is sad to your core because you realize what is not there. You realize what, what, what has been lost. If you don't know that, because you never, you were never in the forest when it was full of beasts and birds and everything else, then you don't have any idea that the forest feels vacant when you're in it, because it's only just ever been a vacant forest for you. All right, hold that thought. So we have responsibility, right? Hold that thought. We have to take a hard break. This is Richard Solomon, Antonio Seant, and Alex Beard, alexbeardstudio.com. We'll be right back. Keep it locked in. Uh, Taking care of business with Rocket Green Radio. Welcome back. Richard Solomon and Antonio Sayant. Rocket Green Radio, taking care of business, tcbradio.com. Of course, we're on YouTube, and we're with Alex Beard, alexbeardstudio.com. You need to check out his website. He, he, he's just a fascinating environmentalist, naturalist, uh, painter, and uh, observer, right? Because you see all kinds of things. What we were talking about in the last segment was sort of how if you never really witnessed nature and you kind of grew up in a place where we're devoid of nature, you can't really appreciate the loss. You know, in many ways, we've experienced that, I think, with food because, you know, in the old days, you grew your food locally, you actually picked it, didn't come in a styrofoam container or whatever. And if you if you ate like something like a chicken, you went to a live chicken place uh, a long, long time ago, and the chicken was not, you know, saran wrapped and, and or whatever. Um, and it really was organic, and it really was fresh, and it really was local. And all of that's changed. We've become much more sterile, much more detached, and much more away from the natural world that we live in, you know, with food, for example. So you, you must be seeing also in, in some of the ways that, too, in all the exotic places that you travel to. One of the, one of the funny um, coincidences of life is that it used to be that when you went to places that were less privileged, as in many third world countries, and there in particular had a lot of people that were starving, they were always very skinny. The, the poorest of the poor have always been the skinniest. Now, because there is exactly what you're talking about with that disconnection between food, where it comes from, being made locally and consumed and in and, and balance, you find that the poorest people are now becoming the biggest because their diet is exclusively being, you know, driven down the McDonald's train. Yeah, processed that's food. That's the cheapest way to get that kind of food out to the world, right? So all this, so you, the Kentucky Fried Chickens and the Taco Bells and the McDonald's of the world are now feeding that huge, huge uh, population of people who were previously very, very skinny. <laughs> right. So, yeah, yeah. You, you, you know, you do, <laughs> you see these, these little ironies, they sort of stick their way in, you know. Um, I, I think that, 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 that we, that we're touching on a subject that's, um, that, that's a larger one that, that has to do with coming back a little bit to what we were talking about before with who we think we want to be. As people, uh, many of us, or, or many people, I should say, prefer the comfort of not wanting to have to, to live a harder, scrabbled life. They, they've, in a way, blinded themselves to thinking that that kind of life is hard and painful and uncomfortable. And I actually totally disagree with that. I think the opposite. So, for example, when I go to Africa, my time, I have no email. If I have to, you know, I, I, I walk off the, the grid, and there are very few places left in the world where that's true, by the way. Um, you know, the, the, you can now get a signal almost everywhere. And just the, 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 the removing yourself from 
the pattern of constant information and everything presented to us packaged and in packaging. Um, it's sort of like a spell being broken and your, your, your daily pace changes and how you think about yourself changes and how you think about what's important changes. Well, I just think that, you know, the technology, it's like, uh, Amy Greeson is the, uh, the woman that she tra- she's a good friend of mine and she, uh, uh, she has a company called Healing Seekers and she travels all over the world in these third world countries that you and I won't even step foot in. Uh, and she'll, uh, speak to medicine doctors to try to find out a cure for, in order to bring her back to the United States, uh, you know, to find a cure for AIDS and, and, uh, cancer through the, the, the plants that she discovers that is curing their people. And yeah, she told me, and she's telling me that uh, these people, they don't know what a cell phone is. They don't know what a movie camera is, or they, they have no clue. And uh, yeah. they have to... Although that's they changing. To, that's changing. Uh, because I've been yeah. in many, many places that are pretty far flung where not that long ago what you're saying is true, and where now, right. like, warriors have phones on their belts. Yeah. And it's, a, it's, and, kind of a, it's kind of trippy, actually. Well, let me, but I just think the phones and technology is like a distraction. And yeah, what you yeah. observe, and what you observed is you're focusing now on the environment. You know, people today, uh, you, you know, they're walking the streets of New York and they're bumping into each other with the cell phones. They're not even paying attention about anything. You know, we were talking, oh, it's amazing. The, uh, the, uh, when I'm in New York, as long as it's not, you know, bone chillingly cold, I walk everywhere. And, and I, and I like to walk, right? So I'll walk five, ten miles in New York during the course of the day. And as a New Yorker, grew up walking the pace of the city to the rhythm of the other people walking. And there was a flow to it, you know. You, you could navigate. There was a slow lane. There was a fast lane. There was weavers. And the whole thing flowed together like ants moving across a, you know, across a plane, right? I mean, there was great order to it. And now everybody's heads down and or mm-hmm. they've got their earphones in or whatever it is. And so the whole rhythm of the walking pace of the city has been disrupted. Uh, I, I did about a seven-mile walk from the Upper East Side to the Lower West Side uh, of late, and uh, it was it was like swimming upstream the whole way. <laughs> well, you know, you know, it's even, right. what's even more interesting in addition to all of that is nobody is really thinking about at least broadly all that electromagnetic frequency output. You know, all this Wi-Fi out there, all these people with cell phones near their organs, near their brains, we're oh, all yeah, exposed man, it to can't this. Be, it can't be healthy to be wearing one of those headsets 18 hours a day trading on one of those crazed pirate ship bond floors or something like that with that stuff being piped right in next to your temple. That can't be good for you. It can't be. And yet, you know, when you think about it, let's say you're in a, a subway car. Well... Mm. You're you're surrounded by a hundred people with cell phones because <laughs> you know that everybody has a cell phone. Yeah, uh, and yeah, of course. and I can only imagine how much signals are being outputted. And you know, we, you you walk into public buildings, government buildings, whatever, and they all have Wi-Fi and airports and everything. And I don't know how I'm not a scientist, but I can't imagine that all of those signals going through all of us day after day, uh, can be good, especially in younger people whose bodies are still forming. No, it can't be good. And there's lots of ways that it can't be good, not just in the way that you're specifically thinking of, but as to which, to which I, by the way, a hundred percent agree, but that also in a more general sense, that it's a contributor to the frenzy that we have created around ourselves. And we created the frenzy through, um, the way we treat each other, we've created the frenzy through our perceptions of politics, both national and international. We've, we've, we've created a frenzy around ourselves with, with xenophobia abroad all, all over the world, where as, as pressures are put from all these different things that I think are not just as linear as it's currently being portrayed, but as lots of little factors. 
like what you're talking about with the the everybody constantly jacked into Wi-Fi and surrounded by signals and cell phones at all times. Right. And I think all these things they're they're, they're, they're they're it's really putting a stick in the in the in the bees nest. Right. And all and of us are, are are zimming around angry as hell and not sure at what. Right. And then of course there's live team coverage and breaking news and you know <laughs> everything's <laughs> an emergency <laughs> and everything get a drop and watch and and you know the thing is i, well, I don't think we're breaking actually news has breaking news on the bar beneath and then another thing up <laughs> in the upper left hand corner and another thing in the upper right hand corner we have to process all of it equally at the same time and well, I, i'll give you something horrifying for a moment at least i think it's well some people would think that this is glorious and some people might take pause so from the fr first time that the first caveman crawled out of his cave forty thousand years ago up until just a few decades ago, there were more inventions from 1990 to the present than in the entirety of our species going back to the time that we first crawled out of the caves. Yeah, but now, you can't beat the wheel and fire. <laughs> well, no, but no, no, no. well, you can't beat those things, but this has to do with how we process who we are. Right, it takes a long time for uh, for innovations in how we think about ourselves to settle throughout the society. I mean, think about tumultuous times like the Reformation, followed by or you know Reformation to Renaissance to backlash to <laughs> to, to Inquisition. You know, you've got the and it's all fighting back and forth between you know, religion and science, and how do we perceive who we are in our place in the universe? Are we surrounded by the planets, or do they surround us? You know, what's the, where are we? And it took us an awfully long time to settle all of those things through great tumult. Now, then, in the course of a couple of decades, we completely revolutionized absolutely everything that we do, and how we do it, and how we take in what we do and how we do it. And I don't think we've caught up to it yet. Well, I'll give you and a great so, example you know, of, what, of what you're talking about. Uh, you know, you look, at the, the, look at the brand new cars that are coming out of this time frame. The cars are actually almost built around cell phones and the Internet. They, mm -hmm, they run on yeah. computers, <laughs> right? They run on computers and they're hard to fix because you need to, you know, in the old days, you just opened up the hood and you started fixing things with your own hands. Now you need a diagnostic machine to look at the to see what chip failures and other things are going on or sensors. Well, or how many generations of cars is it going to be before nobody drives? Well, Not that, many. That's going to create another problem because right now there are limits on people who drive because of you know age or vision or other issues. But now everyone's going to have a car. So now we're going to have even more cars. You know, I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing. It's just an observation that if everybody can have a car, everybody will have a car. And that means that the yeah. highways are going to be just packed. Well, like and, wait for the other <laughs> and wait for the other 500 million Chinese and the other 500 million Indians that don't own cars yet to get theirs. Exactly. Yeah, and think of, and think of the pollution that's going to be caused by that. Well, I, yeah. well, that's the whole idea about going solar and, you know, and, and electric and all that. I think they're trying to, it's like, look, I, I always push hybrid. You know, why are we, why are we, uh, having the actors, uh, why are you picking up still gas guzzling cars? Why aren't you using hybrid? You know, that's my big pet peeve. And they continue doing so. And I just don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. I mean, even the President of the United States, all the cars, all those es es Escalade that, that you see, they're all hybrid. All the vehicles are hybrid vehicles, you know, and, it, and that's how it should be for now, you know. Uh, that home blower boat that I was telling you about that Helen uh, took me on, that yeah. is run on hybrid. And I, that's why I went on, because I was so amazed. I couldn't believe it. I was... I was I was blown away because that was the first time I actually experienced a huge boat like that that that's run on hybrid. Everything every everything that we use and do is going to have to end up 
sooner rather than later being environmentally friendlier. Because right. let's, not fool, let's not fool ourselves. The day-to-day of the details of our distractions pale in comparison to the 25,000 species on the endangered species list and the 40% of all life on the planet that we are currently threatening to eliminate in one of the great extinction events. And if we don't think that we're not going to feel the effects of that, we are all truly ostriches with our heads in the sand. Well, just look at the bee so issue. Just look at the bee issue. We have to do something about it. Look at the colony collapse yeah. problem with bees. You know, if we lose the pollinators, we lose food. I, and a lot of Remember the tent poles. Remember the tent poles. The tent stands for a while. You lose the rhinos, the tent's still up there. Yeah. You lose the polar bears, the tent's still standing. Getting a little shakier. But it's still standing. But here's a question. Now you start you. losing you're, you're, some. You lose one too many poles, and the whole thing collapses. And the, the <clears> bees <throat> could be your pole. <laughs> when you were in Africa, when you were in Africa, did you discover a lot of bees in your area when you were there? Oh yeah, amazing bees. Little water bees that are tiny little things that land in your eyes to collect the little right. bit of moisture that are out of the corners of your eyes. The uh, the, the, the swarms of the traveling, they, we, we call them African killer bees, but of course they're not. The African killer bees were the ones that came to, the, to, to, to Central America and then up into the south of the U.S. as a crossbreed. But the, the, the originator of those, these huge swarms that travel, and you can hear them coming. And yeah. it looks like a, you know, it looks like a, uh, it looks like a ghost or a shadow or something coming across your your visage. It's, yeah. So yes. Yeah, because when Amy Greeson came back from uh, the Congo, she it, it, when they were out there, they were being attacked constantly every day, every day, uh, by swarms of bees. It was a constant thing. Was uh, uh, she was saying, and uh, it, 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 it it was all, all over the place. It was like swarms, and it, and it would never go. It would never. It would never go away. That's you know, you know that it, I, I found it quite funny because you know people are talking about how you know the bees are not dying off. You know, but here here's in Africa. You know, um, I guess it might be different species of bees they're talking about. Oh maybe. yeah, many many different species of bees, many many yeah. different species of bees, and and different to the different continents. But but the crashing of the bee population is not a local event. That, that's happening all over the place. But yeah, there's lots of subspecies and, and subregions where they're probably healthy and uh, as can be. But, uh, you know, that's that same thing. Don't lose the forest through the trees. It's, it, because there yeah. is a crashing, mm-hmm. for crashing to the bee population in lots of places, including here in the U.S. So how do you study all of this science in nature to understand what you're perceiving? I read. Well, I, I figured that. I, you know, I mean, but, God forbid. Well, God forbid. He, he, <laughs> well, well, I think what he's trying to say is like when I read your bio, um, Peter Beard. He's yeah. he's he's a wildlife photographer. What is the connection with him? And how, how, okay, now uh, was he like your role model? Um, yeah, when I was your, young, he certainly my, was. When I was a, when I was when I was a kid growing up in New York right. City in the 1970s, he lived on our sofa when he wasn't in East Africa. And then when I got to be a teenager, I started going over to Africa with him. And you know, I, I, I'm one of those wonky folks who knew that he wanted to live a creative life from a very early age. So I had the advantage of um, of, of having Peter and his, his friends to act a little bit like a fly on the wall and, and, and in some cases be a little more direct. I mean, I, I, I asked Peter an awful lot of questions when I was young. I got to a, pay, a point, however, where I wanted to go off and, and make my own mark. It would be easy to fall into the shadow of somebody as, as prominent as Peter. And so I, I, it's not that I cut off relations with him by any means, but I went off and did my own thing. And I, I, I didn't see him for quite a long time. Although, you right. know, I see him at family stuff. Can you talk about the... Uh, we, we have one minute in this segment, so keep going. 
Okay, can you quickly talk about uh, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis and Senator Robert Trapp? Trapp uh, how, how yeah, so, sure. So, so Jacqueline Onassis, you know who, who she was, and, and Senator Taft was from the great Ohio Republican Taft family that was, you know, senators and presidents. And my father was friends with both, and he started something called the Jefferson Awards, which have become America's preeminent public service awards given out in Washington, the Jefferson Awards Foundation, which has now gotten to be quite a big thing. And he started it with the two of them because the idea was that it should be for public service and nonpartisan. So, uh, so he asked, uh, um, he asked Jackie Onassis if she would co-chair it, and he asked Senator Taft if he would co-chair wow. it, and they, they both said yes, and off they went. All right, so hold and, on. You know, I know that we're at the end of the segment, but we should talk about the, the responsibility of public service. Sure. We'll do that we'll on the other end of this break. So this is Richard Solomon, Antonio Sion, and our very special guest, Alex Beard, alexbeardstudio.com. We'll be right we'll be right back. Keep it locked here. Thanks for listening. Hold on. Richard Solomon and Antonio Sayant welcome you back to Taking Care of Business and Rocket Green Radio. We are with Alex Beard, who is a fascinating, fascinating gentleman. If you have not heard what we've talked about, check this out on YouTube or all the various places that we have, because the first two segments were lightning fast, amazing, and interesting. Now we're going to pick it up because we were ending off the last segment on public service. You're talking about the Jefferson Award. So why don't we just continue with that? Let's talk about public service and what what that means and what it entails. Okay, so so public service to me is both a personal responsibility and then uh, a collective one. So personally, um, I grew up with a father who was who had dedicated his life to public service. So he he went to Yale and graduated in 1961, and then went down to Mississippi and organized um, you know rallies to get to get people to vote. And they and he and a guy named Al Lowenstein, who old time New Yorkers might remember as a congressman from New York, uh, went down and started a, uh, a along with quite a lot of other people, obviously, uh, an effort to run a black shopkeeper for governor in Mississippi in like 1962, 63, something like that, to register people to vote. And came back from that and went on Bobby Kennedy's staff and worked in Bedford-Stuyvesant and then started the Jefferson Awards and something called the National Development Council, which was essentially um, uh, a means to finance minority-owned small businesses, starting in New York, and then it went all over the country to the tune of many billions of dollars and many millions of jobs. And in the course of that, as a result, I grew up with the greatest of the aspirations of the civil rights and the, and the Kennedyites from the 1960s. And while they were all gone by the time I was born, with the exception of Jackie Onassis, um, that uh, I was nonetheless raised in their raised with their messages given to me every day closely and as one of those things that is just simply whatever you become one of the things you have to do not just because if you're lucky like I was to be born in a in a you know fairly affluent and stable family life with all of the advantages to the world not just because you had a responsibility to give back but because ultimately the fabric of the entirety of our society is reliant upon all of us giving back to each other, bottom headed up and top headed down. So that's the personal part of where it came from. And then that's the collective responsibility that we have. My personal version of it manifests through something called the Watering Hole Foundation, which I founded a couple of years ago in, 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 the, in 2012, I guess it was. And I did it because I was in East Africa, and I had my seven-year-old son at the time with me in a tent on camel safari on the banks of a river called the Ngari Dari. And I took him there because I wanted him to see the stars, and I wanted him to, I wanted him to experience what the wilderness would, should be like when it is still intact as the wilderness is supposed to be. 
And through the course of that, one night, we're sitting in our tent, which is really like mosquito, you know, basically like a mosquito in that mesh. And all around us is a herd of elephants feeding. And I mean, close enough, you reach out to the tent and smack one on the backside. If you're <laughs> so inclined. And, you know, so that when elephants, people think that elephants trumpet, but they don't. They, they, I mean, sometimes they do. But mostly what they do is they rumble. And it's the kind of sound you feel in your chest and through your feet in the ground. And it's a deep resonance. And so I'm sitting in this tent with my seven-year-old son, and I had had that experience myself when I was young, and here I was passing it along to my boy in a place where if you woke up in the morning and opened your eyes, you wouldn't know what, not what day it was, but not what decade or necessarily century or millennium, because you were just in a place where the cycle of wilderness had not changed. And so in the context of that, I wanted to show off my son to my friends who I had grown up with in East Africa. And so I took him around. And of course, many of them are conservationists of the highest order. And they all to a man and woman said, the poaching crisis for elephants is worse than it has ever been. All hands on deck. That was the quote that Ian Douglas Hamilton said to me face to face with my, with my son in Samburu in that year. He said, all hands on deck. Do wow. anything you can and everything you can. And so I thought to myself, sitting there with my son in that tent, that if I don't do something about this, even in a small way, shame on me, that I would then be complicit. And I was at the ivory burns in the late 80s and the early 90s where I watched 40,000 pounds of ivory go up in smoke and was like, it's like being in a holocaust. You know, and you right. watch, it's, 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 uh, the, the, the comparison is unmistakable. And so I then did the puzzle of trying to figure out what I could actually do, right? I mean, because we, there, we, we have a combination of a sense of helplessness where things that seem to be larger than we are occur beyond our control. And so as a result, that helplessness inspires a sense where there's nothing that you can do, and that in turn leads to complacency, which is unacceptable. So... I, I, I did the puzzle, and the puzzle to me was that what do I do? I make art. What do I have to offer? I can make paintings and drawings that people like enough that they will want to buy them. And so I could then sell those paintings and give the money back to the places that I loved and, by, and do that by giving it to the community themselves, the people actually on the ground. So I, I, I did it once myself, where I said, okay, I'm going to go back on, on Camel Safari, and I went three or four months after I brought my son back to the States. And I went and I made a couple of paintings in situ in the bush, tracking elephants and doing that sort of thing. And then I came back to the States, I showed them, I sold them, I turned around and I gave the money back to uh, a small tribe called the Mokogodo, who um, had a particularly bad poaching problem in a particular spot. And so I, I, I was able to earmark the money to help their security to stop the poaching in a particular place. It was something that I could understand. It was something that I knew I could accomplish. And it was something that I knew that I could sell to myself and the people who were interested in what I was doing. Not because wow. I was going to ask them for lots of money, but just because it was to say that everybody, whomever you are, can do something. We all have a talent. And you just have to implement your talent and your interest and just decide to do so. The most difficult part about taking a trip is deciding to go in the first place. Once you have your airplane tickets, the rest of it just happens. And so right. too, true, with making the decision that you are going to stand up and do something for the greater good. Well, that's why in we the do case this radio the show. environment, yeah. that greater good is of the utmost importance because everything else is irrelevant if we have no place to live. That's why we do this radio wow. show, because we try to bring these voices to the forefront, because most of these messages are lost in the haze of breaking news and live team coverage of, of non-issues. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right. No, I know. Yeah. yeah. When, I heard, when I heard about you, I, 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 I read your bio, and I, I went on all your websites, and I just totally was amazed that there was somebody like you that's doing this, that was able to Well, I think combine. there are a lot of people like me doing this, actually. I mean, nobody's particularly doing exactly what I'm doing, because to the point that we all have different talents and different interests, the details differ. 
But I think you'll right. find, and you already have, because you are people like that yourselves, and you know others. You, right. Everybody does something, and you yes. uh, not everybody. Everybody, <laughs> everybody should do something, and many people do. I guess that's the <laughs> that's a, that's a better way to characterize it, probably. Yeah, but you've been doing it. You you've been doing it for a long time. You've been doing it for that's what? Right. Oh, you, you know, and you. You used, you know, Peter Beard, uh, you, you know, uh, his expertise, and and you went your own way to find your niche, you know, and yeah. you expanded on that, and it's a beautiful thing. I mean, yes, uh, uh, you know, the kids that we did uh, last week, a couple of weeks ago, um, they're into plastic straws in the oceans, but they're also into uh, saving, you know, you know, animal, animal conservation and cheetah, you know, cheetahs and Penguins. and rhinos, and it's it's just totally amazing. Here you are talking about elephants, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, yeah. It, it, it well, you know, so, there, there's so many of these things that are in jeopardy, and the the consequences of losing them are so dire. Um, right. That, that, you know, it's not surprising to me that the more people you talk to about this, the more people are activated in some version of it or another. Because, look, the shooting match, once it's over, it's over. It's not like you can just genetically re-engineer a population of wild elephants, cheetahs, or lions, or whatever. It, 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 once they're gone, they're gone. So, yeah. so that leads me to this yeah. question, which is how has all of these incredible experiences changed your day-to-day -day living where you live now. <laughs> no, no, I have a lot of pets. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the way that it's changed my... How has it changed my living? You know, I tell you, I don't think it's changed it at all. And the reason that I say that is that I live my life in the same way that I make my art. I make it up as I go along. I start with something which I believe has an intrinsic value to it in the movement of the art or in the case of my life, the standards of the moral base from which I come. And then from then on, it's constantly fixing mistakes. The whole process of making art and living life is tacking across the wind to get to where you want to be. We don't live lives the, the, with, with, with the sails full and the wind at our back sipping a margarita. And we shouldn't. We should fight for the things that we believe in. And that does not mean that you know how to get there. You just know you have to fight. And that's true of, I think, everybody's day-to-day -day life. In details are different, but doesn't change the fact that we've all, we're all struggling on the razor's edge of insanity. And anyone that tells you otherwise is lying. Right? And so in the course of that, so too the way I make my art and the way I live my life. It hasn't changed. That's been true since I was a kid. <laughs> I'm always one step ahead of complete catastrophe. So coming to my next question then, um, what you did is you published a book, correct? And yeah, you yeah put, several you, at this point, actually. Right. So the, the one you were promoting at the uh, at your Yeah, the Abstract Naturalism and the Painting of Life, a Brush with Nature is the title wow. of it, A Brush with Nature. And it's a... Uh, um, it's a monograph, right? It's one of those big honking coffee table books. And, uh, but I'm not the guy who just sticks his name, Alex Beard, on the front of a book full of pretty paintings and hopes for the best. Uh, I think there needs to be purpose to it. So the style of work that's in the book is called abstract naturalism, which is a phrase that I coined to describe what I make. And the book is not just a catalog of works of that, but, but where the thought process comes from, the mathematics classically going back to the Greeks from how composition is put together, the divine proportion, Fibonacci's exponential growth systems, and how those manifest in nature, and then what that in turn teaches us about ourselves. That's what that book is about. Uh, it's a, I, I, I like that book, actually. I have to say, I'm not sure that I wasn't sure I would, but I do. And so, is, there web <laughs> is, there, no, no, is there a website that we could... Uh... Uh, yeah, any, find anything book? of mine. Yeah, you know, anything of mine that you want to know more about or procure, one way or another, from puzzles to books to to, to drawings and paintings, all of that can be found through my studio website, like spiritstudio.com. Oh, okay. 
Right, because it all, one way or another, you can find them at Amazon and you can find them at local bookstores and places like that, a lot of these things. And, you know, there's different galleries around the world that have different things, but it's always one way to find out what's going on. The best way is to come and find out from the studio side. And what, which, is, of course, your look, what, what is your future look like? Are you going to have another exhibit uh, in New York City soon or, or what state? I won't do where? one. No, I won't do one soon, but I'm sure I'll do one again. Uh, I, I I don't just cycle for business. I come when I have something to say. Right. Um, right. I, so I think the next thing is that uh, I mean, the thing I'm working on right now is a book called The Last Laugh, which is um, a continuation of a of a series of stories that I wrote and illustrated, which are under the umbrella of called Tales from the Watering Hole. But individually, his books are Jungle Grapevine, Monkey See, Monkey Draw, and Crocodile's Tears. And the next one in that in that uh, collection, The Last Laugh, is currently noodling around in my in my head. Um, and when I do these, when I do those books, they're they're parable based. They're moral stories, like Aesop. Kipling's just so stories. And so when I then, as a result, I then. If I'm going to tell one of those stories, it's because I believe that there's a moral that needs to be needs to be sown. <laughs> you know, Crocodile right, Tears right. is about the environment, right? So I then go around and okay, so that one I talk to kind of 150, 200,000 kids or something about endangered species in the environment, and so yeah. I'll be doing a little bit of that. But I certainly will also be painting and traveling to Africa and. You know, fighting the good fight to keep the places that are still intact intact in terms of wilderness and and and, uh, and the species that live within them. And and ultimately, I'll never venture far off of the subject of how do we perceive ourselves in relationship to our surroundings, yeah. and how does that make us better together, and uh, and apart. I mean, how does that make us? better human beings in in the one minute we have left because this just flew by like crazy what could we learn from the indigenous peoples in these remote places that we don't get here okay that, so that they do, that I'll, they see, do. I'll see if i can do this in a minute i went and i interviewed the last caveman in the Mokogoto Hills, a guy whose name was Lekatiko, and he was the lineage, the last in a lineage of 40,000 people, excuse me, 40,000 years of people living in these caves. I mean, literally cavemen, right, that had been there since the dawn of time. And I went to interview him with the thought that it would be like going on the mount and asking the guru for wisdom. And so I got into his cave, and I met with this guy who was as old as Methuselah. And I said to him, do you have any advice? And he said in his Cushitic language, into, translated into Swahili, from Swahili translated into me in English, that God has cursed us, that we don't respect each other, and we don't, and we don't expect our, uh, the other inhabitants on the planet, as in the animals, and as a result, God has cursed us. Now that's said from a, from, from a raisin of a man sitting in a cave in the, in, in, in the place where man was born. And I think we should heed what he's warning us of. Uh, that's very profound. Uh, yes, yeah. little little wisdom from a man in a man in a cave. All righty, that was an incredible and a powerful hour of radio. Wow. Can thank you enough for being our guest. That was Alex oh Beard. Oh, it was awfully nice of you guys to have me. I really appreciate it. Not, my, my wife won't let me talk like this. She gets bored and walks out. <laughs> then, then we'll have you back <laughs> so in a future you very show much for, the, for the voice. Then we'll have you back in a future show. This has been Alex Beard, alexbeardstudio.com, Antonio Sayant, Rocket Green Radio, and Richard Solomon, Taking Care of Business. We will see you all next week. And in that time, think about the environment and what you can do to make it a little bit better for all of us. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Mm-hmm.